Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning to those of you joining us in the United States and good evening to those of you joining us from across the Indo-Pacific. I'm Michael Green, I'm Senior Vice President for Asia at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Professor at Georgetown. I'm joined with some colleagues who I will introduce shortly uh, to introduce to you um, the results of an effort we undertook over the past few months um, in the form of our report, The Sunnylands Principles on Enhancing Democratic Partnership in the Indo-Pacific region. <clears throat> um, this report is on our website, so you can look at it at CSIS.org uh, and follow along as we discuss it with our colleagues today. Uh, the Indo-Pacific region is emerging as the epicenter uh, over geopolitics, but also how states should organize themselves in the face of new challenges, both at home, transnational, <clears throat> and geopolitical. Um, CSIS partnered with the National Endowment for Democracy and the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands on a dialogue to develop strategies <clears throat> so that we could approach uh, the new challenges, but also take advantage of the growing support <clears throat> for democratic norms in the Indo-Pacific region uh, to advance stability, prosperity, uh, human rights, good governance, women's empowerment, <clears throat> and um, find ways to work uh, together, find ways so that our diverse approaches to democracy and governance work in harmony. Uh, and uh, even at a time when uh, many around the world are challenging uh, the validity and the uh, efficiency of democratic governance, while others, uh, most notably Korea, for example, are showing that democratically organized states have responded extremely well to the pandemic, <clears throat> we uh, wanted to put forward a set of principles that would uh, show that there is unity across the most successful states in the Indo-Pacific uh, on the very key principles that have brought us success and will bring us greater success, stability, and prosperity going forward. <clears throat> in addition to our partnership with um, the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, um, and the Annenberg Foundation at Sunnylands, we received support from the government of Japan uh, for our work. Um, and what I would like to do today um, is summarize the principles that we all agreed on, uh, on how to advance governance and democracy in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, we'll entertain some uh, questions uh, from the audience. You can send them uh, over uh, the Google uh, address um, uh, that's on the website if you're, if you're uh, watching this. <clears throat> um, and uh, I'll shortly introduce some of the participants from across the region and the United States um, uh, and also the principles themselves. Uh, but we held this meeting to um, brainstorm and come up with um, our ideas for advancing uh, democracy, governance, human rights in Asia um, by uh, holding a retreat um, with uh, over a dozen thought leaders on democratic governance from the region and the United States. And we could not have had a more um, beautiful setting a more conducive setting for candid discussion of different experiences, both national and personal experiences in the democratic space, um, and a more historic uh, setting uh, to address these issues. And that was uh, at the um, beautiful uh, Annenberg Estate in Sunnyland. So our host there was Ambassador David Lane. I'd like to turn to him now uh, to uh, tell us a bit about Sunnylands. Um, Ambassador Lane has served in a number of posts in government, including representative uh, to the UN agencies in Rome, uh, under the Obama administration and uh, president and CEO of the One Campaign, the global advocacy organization, uh, and other work at the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So he's a, a veteran on these kinds of issues and was our gracious and thoughtful host in Sunnylands. Ambassador Lane. Thank you, Mike, uh, for that kind introduction. And um, I believe we gathered in January, which at this point in time feels like a long, long time ago, um, it was actually one of our last in-person convenings and reminds us of what was, what was possible and what we hope to get to again uh, sometime next year. But it was a real privilege to, um, to host many of the participants in this call. 
And um, since Sunnyland, since we're fortunate enough to have our name in, uh, associated with the principles, I'd love to tell you why we think, uh, you know, our relationship to the issue. So we, um, we do high level convenings, um, historically have, and we have kind of two of the top uh, pillars of our strategy are to promote democratic engagement and strengthen democratic institutions, but even more centrally to focus on global cooperation with a regional focus on the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And um, just to remind some of you, we uh, uh, some time ago, 1990, hosted George Herbert Walker Bush and Japanese Prime Minister Kaifu for an important sort of reset uh, gathering and dinner um, at Sunnylands. President Obama hosted Xi Jinping, which I'm sure most of you know, in 2013, which is sort of kick off their, uh, their relationship. And then um, uh, ASEAN heads of state gathered with President Obama in 2016, which was the first ever standalone meeting with South Southeast Asian leaders in the United States. We also continue to host Track 1.5 and Track 2 uh, dialogue meetings. We hosted an important, uh, I think, uh, US-India strategic dialogue. Dhruv, I know you were a key participant in that. We've also hosted Track 2 meetings with US and Chinese leaders from several sectors and we're supporting various task forces and working groups of American uh, China specialists focusing on the US-China relationship. So um, that's why we were able to be participants and why we were uh, eager to host uh, many of you here for this important meeting. It was a real pleasure to partner with Mike Green, with Amy Lair, uh, Nicholas A. Cheney, uh, and their colleagues at CSIS uh, on the initiative. We also wanna thank Brian Joseph and Lynn Lee from the, for the, uh, from the National Endowment for Democracy for their strong leadership uh, and for the support of democracy around the world. Most importantly, uh, I'd like to thank our partners from the Indo-Pacific region who traveled that long distance to Sunnylands in January to participate in the initiative, uh, reaching consensus on these principles from a group of such distinguished leaders from Australia, India, Japan, Philippines, South Korea, and Indonesia was really an impressive undertaking. Um, so now the hard work of transforming these principles into actions to help build a more democratic, accountable, and transparent, uh, transparently governed <laughs> Pacific community begins. Um, Sunnyland's principles on an enhanced democratic partnership uh, in the Indo-Pacific are a strong affirmation of the values that our benefactors, Walter and Leonore Annenberg, uh, I know would be very proud of and were just to close, uh, very, very proud to have been associated with this important effort. So uh, thank you for letting us and uh, back to you, Mike. Uh, thank you, David. So um, we gathered uh, a group of distinguished um, uh, political and thought leaders uh, and scholars on democratic norms uh, from or uh, related to the Indo-Pacific region. Let me briefly describe who came. It was not a long list, but it was a distinguished and important list. We were joined in Sunnylands um, by Micah Bromwitz, uh, who heads Freedom House in Washington, uh, Justice Conchita Carpio Morales, from whom we'll hear shortly from the Philippines, uh, Michael Fullilove, uh, who runs the Lowy Institute in Australia, um, Dhruva Jaishankar from the Observer Research Foundation of India, uh, Derek Mitchell, uh, who is an old Asia hand and head of the National Democratic Institute, uh, Marty Natalagawa, former foreign minister of Indonesia. Uh, Shin Gak Su, former vice foreign minister of Korea. Uh, Takasu Yukio, uh, former senior uh, uh, foreign ministry official and uh, ambassador to multilateral organizations and Japan's leading um, uh, thinker from the foreign ministry on uh, democratic norms. Um, Dan Twining, head of the International Republican Institute and then the organizers were uh, Brian Joseph and Lynn Lee from the NED, um, Ambassador Lane, who you heard from, uh, Jeffrey Phillips, uh, who works with him at Sunnylands, and uh, Amy Laird, Nick St. Cheney, and myself from CSIS. We produced, um, together with these broad principles, um, a scoping paper, which is more of a, an analytical or scholarly paper. Uh, this was a CSIS product. It's also on the website, um, which analyzes uh, the trends in uh, democratic governance, unity, the challenges, uh, particularly in the context of COVID-19. It was a background paper. We received very helpful uh, comments, but it's a CSIS product. Nobody who signed on to the principles uh, owns uh, the output. 
Um, but what everyone I, I mentioned on that list did do was sit down in a really candid and thoughtful and deeply experienced and principled way, um, think through from the perspective of their national experiences, their neighbors uh, in the region, uh, efforts in the United States, Australia, Japan, Indonesia, and elsewhere at promoting democracy at home and abroad. What are the guiding uh, principles that would um, take us forward in a regional discussion on how we can do more together, learning from each other, uh, redoubling our efforts. And uh, that is uh, in the report, the, the document that's on our website. But let me briefly summarize those principles before turning to some of the participants to elaborate briefly, and then we'll take your questions. We'll hear last in the list, but not least from Lynn Lee, by the way, who's going to describe what the uh, National Endowment uh, for Democracy community of organizations uh, with CSIS and others um, uh, in the region will do to take these principles on the road. And, um, and build national and regional discussions across uh, the Indo-Pacific on what more we can do to implement some of the key insights we thought we had contributed to the conversation. So in the document, we, um, we went through those um, uh, key uh, elements that we thought uh, explain why democracy matters, um, that describe democracy in the region, and that form the outline of an action plan. Why democracy matters? Uh, first and fundamentally, as um, multiple uh, international agreements signed by uh, all the countries represented in our discussion have uh, emphasized, um, democracy is critical to the enjoyment of basic rights, uh, the inherent right that all people have for a responsive uh, and accountable government. Um, and democracy works. Democratic societies are more stable and responsive to their citizens. When you look at the 10 or 15 most successful countries in Asia, take your pick, 80% will be based on some form of democratic constitutional government. Many will be struggling, many will have setbacks, but the premise by which the governed have accepted their leaders is an accountable government. Um, third, uh, democratic norms are widespread. We've done surveys in CSIS, including most recently a survey of thought leaders in Southeast Asia, and there are public opinion polls that bear this out as well, uh, that indicate that overwhelmingly, when elites, thought leaders, or citizens are asked, uh, when they're able to answer these polls, when they're in societies that allow them to participate in these polls, when they're asked what is the best form of government, uh, overwhelmingly, they choose democracy. Uh, in our uh, surveys over the years, including one we just did a few months ago of Southeast Asian thought leaders, um, the support uh, grows every time we take the survey. Um, there is no um, Beijing consensus that has accepted, uh, has been accepted widely across Asia. There's no Beijing consensus in Beijing, frankly, if you have uh, uh, Chinese scholars and friends you talk to. Um, so the way people want to organize their societies, uh, it may not be exactly the way the United States or the way that Japan or the way that India thinks of it, but it generally lives in the same neighborhood. Uh, a constellation of ideas around basic freedoms, women's empowerment, free and fair elections, human rights. Um, all of these norms in the surveys we've done and others have done receive widespread support. Now they're defined differently, which is a key element we'll come to, but broadly speaking, those are the norms that are widely accepted. Um, and democracy matters because it faces challenges. As Freedom House has reported, um, there are uh, more democracies losing traction than gaining traction right now. And COVID-19 has exacerbated that as governments, sometimes for legitimate reasons, sometimes not, have had to institute a greater tracking and control and surveillance of their people. We um, felt after hearing the experiences of uh, the participants that there are, as many of us came into this recognizing, multiple paths to successful governance and democracy that build on these principles I just uh, elaborated, um, uh, and that um, we need a diverse and inclusive plan among states, democratic states, um, to improve get democratic governance in our own countries and for all. We need, first of all, to recognize that democracy is diverse. There is no monolithic view, despite some key core principles about accountability um, and um, uh, human rights that, um, that animate all of us. Um, we need to actively support democracy at home and in the region. Um, and uh, there are many ways that India or Indonesia, for example, are supporting uh, democratic governance 
in the region. They're different from what Japan might do or Australia might do. The US and Australia and Japan are close allies. What we do is a bit different from each other. What the National Endowment for Democracy does is a bit different from what the Asia Foundation does, and I'm on their board. There are multiple uh, ways to advance these norms. And in effect, we argued for an all of the above approach. We've spent too much time historically between the US and India, between the US and Japan, between Australia and Japan, between Japan and Korea, <clears throat> arguing who has the best path to democracy, who has the right approach to human rights, who has the right approach to hard problems we face, like uh, the democratic transition in Burma, for example. Um, the bottom line is we should spend a lot less time arguing about who's right, uh, look at the commonalities, learn from each other, um, and um, actively build on what we've done and honestly learn from each other's approaches uh, for the success of all. And that's why we argued that we need a holistic approach, um, that um, all of our countries should do more to mainstream support for democratic norms in the diplomacy, the development, even the defense policies that we undertake. Um, this is an all of government and all the democracies working together. And again, there will be diverse approaches to how the Indian Army approaches this versus the Japanese Self-Defense Forces, how the State Department uh, Bureau of uh, Democracy, Religion and Labor will approach it compared to, for example, the Korean Foreign Ministry. Um, but we should use all our tools, we agreed. We need to engage multilateral bodies. Um, multilateral institutions are frustrating. ASEAN is frustrating. Consensus-based organizations are frustrating. But that's where the trench warfare happens in diplomacy to advance democratic norms and set expectations and standards. And it's intense work. And all of us, and particularly the United States right now, uh, needs to step up its game uh, in the way we bring these norms in different ways. It may be uh, something about internet governance. It may be something about development. It isn't necessarily about elections or something that immediately seems like democracy, but in the way we approach uh, infrastructure development, whatever the policy issue is in these multilateral institutions, um, we, we democracies need to coordinate and bring these agendas forward uh, step by step. We all agreed, Republicans and Democrats, um, that uh, uh, there is an economic component and the relationship between democracy and economic development is one that will continue um, until the cows come home uh, because um, it's, a good, it's a good topic for scholars um, and which is the chicken and which is the egg uh, are scholarly debates that the journal of democracy and the NED will continue to have and we should have. Um, but the bottom line is that um, economic growth and development is critical. And the challenges that democracies have faced are clearly related to some of the challenges we've faced promoting equitable and inclusive growth. So there are different approaches to how you get um, equitable and inclusive growth. And even the organizations affiliated with the NED will have very different answers to how you do that. Um, and how much you focus on supply versus demand, on labor versus um, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation and so forth. But in our, all of us agreed, coming from different countries and different ideological perspectives, that our, 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 our democracy efforts and funding for democracy-related programming um, has to look at um, how uh, we can promote equitable and inclusive growth. We need to demonstrate that these democratic norms contribute to that, to broaden community of people who promote democracy and who, who benefit from it. Uh, unanimously agreed that we must, um, in all of our approaches to democracy, use inclusive approaches um, and involve women. Um, uh, here, the, the political science, the social science is pretty clear that when women are involved in conflict resolution mechanisms, uh, economic development strategies, um, you know, from Goldman Sachs to the um, OECD, to the Japanese foreign ministry, the data is clear, um, you get more effective outcomes. <laughs> um, and uh, that goes beyond just inclusion uh, uh, and leadership of women, all underrepresented groups um, in the process of democracy and development uh, have to be included. And when they are, you have more enduring results. Engage youth. Um, polls actually show in many countries that youth are more enthusiastic about democracy. So that's promising. And that's both an opportunity and a responsibility as all of us look at developing strategies for um, democratic governance and unity and cooperation among ourselves. Um, 
strong agreement, and this might not have been the case a decade or two ago, but very strong agreement across all national experiences. We need to work with the private sector. The business community benefits from a level playing field that comes from more accountable government and transparent governance uh, and rule of law and predictability. <clears throat> and business has something to give back in terms of public-private partnerships. And I think Amy may something, say something about this later. She does a lot of work on this. We spent a lot of time talking about technology governance, which is a longer conversation, but suffice it to say, this business is different than it was 20 years ago <clears throat> uh, because of disinformation campaigns, because of um, assaults on uh, democratic norms in uh, cyberspace, <clears throat> because of surveillance and AI, <clears throat> um, and this has to be a priority. And finally, uh, we all agreed uh, that an, an independent media is critical to keep an eye on all of the stakeholders, um, uh, not just government, but government, but business, uh, and even scholars, uh, to make sure that uh, we have accountable, transparent governance uh, moving forward. Um, and I just conclude by saying the overall uh, sense in Sunnylands, and it wasn't just because it's a beautiful place with perfect weather um, uh, and uh, wonderful opportunities for conversation, the overall um, sense that people brought in from different national experiences uh, and different ideological and functional perspectives in the US was optimism. That we face some headwinds, but the overall trends um, are, are favorable if we are wise and if we work together, which is what we must uh, do given the circumstances we're in. Let me turn now to uh, some other participants to give some views, then we'll open for questions. I'm gonna first turn to Amy Lair, my colleague at CSIS, who was, uh, is director of the Human Rights Initiative at CSIS, launched in 2014. Um, she spent uh, her time before CSIS in private practice at uh, Foley Hogue LLP, uh, working on social, uh, corporate and social responsibility strategies um, and these kinds of private uh, public partnerships. <clears throat> then I'll turn to uh, the Honorable Conchita Carpio Morales. Um, uh, she retired in June 2011 from the Supreme Court of the Philippines, where she served for nine years. Um, and it was appointed at that point as the fifth ombudsman of the Republic of the Philippines, which she held until July 2018. Um, for her years of public service and tireless campaign against corruption, often in less than safe circumstances, Justice Carpio Morales was named Filipino of the Year by the Philippine Daily Inquirer and bestowed the Fearless and Peerless Crusader Award by the Philippine Constitution Commission and has run numerous other awards for her um, vision and her courage. Uh, advancing Democratic Norms and Accountability. Dhruva Jai Shankar is Director of the U.S. Initiative at the New Delhi-based Observer Research Foundation. He's spent time at Brookings um, and uh, the German Marshall Fund, and we'll hear from him. And finally, uh, we'll turn to Lynn Lee, who's Director for Asia at the NED, um, a congressionally funded uh, grant-making foundation and thought leader on these issues. Um, she was uh, at Intermedia before that as a Stanford grad, and uh, has um, some things to tell us about what might come next. So in that batting order, Amy, I'm going to turn off my microphone and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Well, some of what I'll say, I think will be a little bit of an expansion of what Mike's already, on things he's already touched on. But I do want to talk about why I think the Sunnylands principles are really important and timely. Um, and sort of what I see is the problem is that they're addressing and what some of the solutions are. And I'll go into a little more depth on just a few of those principles. So we know right now that we're in a challenging time, as Mike noted, um, space for civil society and free speech is retracting around the world. We know that the very notion of democracy and associated concepts of human rights are under attack, being portrayed as inefficient and messy. And COVID's really provided some new opportunities for space for civil society to close, which often uh, rises up as either fake, fake news laws that then really are used to repress political opponents or new forms of surveillance that may be legitimate but need to come to a timely end when the pandemic is no longer with us. But two, two points already made, I do think, although some of this is rather concerning it sometimes maybe it looks more bleak than it really is if you really look at the data and what people say they want what they want is rule of law accountability and a reduction in corruption and nepotism and people are frustrated with democracy because it hasn't delivered on a lot of these qualities to the extent that we would hope 
it doesn't mean people want to live in an authoritarian state. And so I do think that if Indo-Pacific democracies step up their efforts to deliver on those elements in people's lives, then we could see renewed support for democracy uh, throughout the region. I'm going to talk about three aspects of the Sunny Lands principles and why I think they're important for the future. So first, the principles explicitly see civil society as part of the solution. I do think that we need to be cognizant that you can build all the accountability mechanisms and transparency requirements for government that you want, but if there's no people and organizations to use those mechanisms, they're not very meaningful. And so thinking about civil society, and I include journalists in that, uh, as really key players, I think, is the right emphasis and as players who need support right now more than they've ever needed it before in my lifetime anyway. The principles also call, second, for us to think bigger and broader and in more integrated ways. So what do I mean by that? First, the principles talk about engaging non-traditional actors in support for democracy. So that could include, for example, as Mike noted, business. So business can play a role in a few ways, and it's really in its interest. So they can, in their own operations, respect human rights, be accountable, avoid corruption. But I also think business needs to think harder about the future they want to see. So for responsible businesses operating in places with strong accountability, with strong rule of law, transparency is in their favor. They're not going to succeed in a nepotistic environment. And so business getting more engaged actually in the policy environment as it affects those issues, I think may be a trend we need to see in the future. And that again, is very much in their own interest. So that addresses the actors, but then there's this broader sense of what are the different areas of policy that we can engage? So again, sort of not looking at democracy support as its own little world, but rather how do we embed that in all these different areas of policy? So just to give you two easy ones. One would be uh, when governments, for example, are um, involved in export credit, making sure that they're giving funding to organizations that are held to principles around accountability and transparency and participation, uh, participation of communities, right? That, that itself can help build democracy from the ground up. Uh, also, as we think about security policy, what kind of technology, for example, are our democratic governments providing to others? And how are we ensuring that those aren't those technologies aren't actually being used um, in ways that are not supportive of democracy. Last, I do want to talk about tech governance. It was a thing that came up a number of times in our meeting. And from my perspective, getting this right is going to be vital to the future of democracy and freedom across the globe. As we know, technology can support democracy, free expression, citizen engagement, etc. And on the other hand, we have sort of this rising specter of digital authoritarianism. So the use of technologies like facial recognition and gate recognition to track and target opponents. Getting this governance of these dual, basically dual use technologies is going to be really key. And this isn't just true in Asia, but Asia is where we see both the development of a lot of these technologies and really significant uptake by both governments and the private sector. My program, we traveled to Southeast Asia to three countries in February, right, right about the last time period we could have done that before COVID really took hold. But, and we're talking to actors in other regions. And, and again, the uptake in Asia is really quite remarkable. But what we saw was a lot of use of technologies like facial recognition, but almost no governance. So often there weren't even privacy laws, the most basic privacy laws. There was almost no social understanding of when and how the technologies were being deployed or why that might be concerning. And so I just think this is an area where there's, there's a huge blooming of new technology. And at the same time, all across the Indo-Pacific, including here in the US, we don't have the tools to grapple with that yet. And it's got to be a priority both at home and in our neighborhoods. So I think that's an area that I would hope to see uh, support for democ dem democratization in the region really focus on. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Amy. Um, Justice Corporal Morales, Cochita, may we hear from you? You'll have to, there we go. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. The assembly of the, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Annenberg Estate at Sunnylands accomplished what it set to achieve, that is 
to percolate strategies to advance democratic governance and fundamental principles for human rights from across the Indo-Pacific region. The organizers of the assembly, the CSIS, the National Endowment for Democracy and Annenberg Trust at Sunnylands thus deserve our congratulations and gratitude. The assembly could not have come at a better time. In fact, it came in the nick of time as we grapple the pandemic spawned by COVID-19. Crisis like the pandemic provide a fertile ground for the commission of corruption and abuse of power. In the case of the Philippines, Congress granted additional emergency powers to the president uh, during the uh, quarantine pandemic period, billions of pesos have been set aside to assist the economically challenged citizens. Amid the absurdity of cases of infections, media, the academe, and the youth, among other stakeholders, have been actively demanding transparency, accountability, respecting the measures it has, the government has undertaken, and how it has implemented the measures, and how the monetary stimulus has been for what, farmed out and how much has actually been released has always been consistently insisted upon by the media, the academia, and the youth in light of complaints against some government agencies about irregularities in the disbursement of funds like overpriced medicine and PPE. In other words, that private uh, stakeholders are given a space for participation in governance reflects an ideal principle to advance governance norms for, for democracy to remain the ideal stable system of government, transparency, accountability, and people participation in governance must remain a basic principle. Democratic governments must, of course, arrest the flaws that go with it. Specifically with respect to the Philippines, social gathering is prescribed and penalized during quarantine lockdown period. A police officer, however, was caught on video celebrating his birthday with guests present, complete with a buffet spread of food and community singing. That certainly violated the proscription against social gathering. To date, however, he has remained kept free and has not been faulted. Upon the other hand, a number of citizens who are found not to be wearing face masks in public places are being arrested and detained. If that is not double standard, I don't know what is. And that is why the consistent application of the rule of law should remain a basic principle to advance democratic governance. Thank you. Th thank you, Justice Carpio Morales. I think we may come back to some of those uh, issues you uh, illustrated with very concrete and uh, troubling examples of how the COVID-19 pandemic is being used to close civil society space, you know, giving real specificity to the warning that Amy gave us. Um, and I think we'll come back to that. Let me turn first, though, to uh, uh, Druva. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to CSIS and to uh, the NED and the Annenberg Trust at Sunnylands for involving me in this initiative. Um, I'll just make a few quick points, some of which I think elaborate a little bit upon what, what's been said already. Um, you know, and part of this exercise, I think, was very interesting hearing from you know, diverse perspectives, not just geographically diverse perspectives, but people who also had uh, experience from in different aspects of uh, working with democracy, whether it's from a legal perspective or, or you know, people from the media, people from uh, governments and so forth. Um, but, you know, I think a few things stood out to me. One um, was... Uh, I think reinforcing the notion that democracy works and is accountable and is practical. Um, and I, you know, it gives the example actually of, of the response to the coronavirus. Um, while at first glance it may look quite damning that uh, over 90% of the people who've died from the coronavirus pandemic to date around the world live in democracies uh, when they make, when those people constitute a little under 50% of the world's population. 
Um, but I think if you scratch that the the, the data a little bit, I think uh, it, it reveals a much more complex and and, and uh, picture about the correlation uh, democracy and and uh, crisis management in this case and uh, public health crisis. Uh, so for every uh, you know uh, 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 colleagues in China are, are trumpeting. Uh, their example as a sort of uh, success case. But, you know, for every uh, China, there's also been a Mongolia, South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, who've all shown uh, just in Northeast Asia that there isn't necessarily a trade-off between, uh, between um, democracy and, and an ability of a government to respond to a, a major public health crisis. And it's not just restricted to Northeast Asia. I think there are successful examples, Germany, Argentina, New Zealand, Greece, countries that are de remain de democracies and, and have uh, quite successfully managed um, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. A second point is that democracy remains enduringly popular, even if it has received, you know, suffered setbacks and continues to suffer setbacks around the world. Um, in a 2017 survey of six Indo-Pacific countries that I was involved with, in, this was three years ago, uh, an average of eight out of ten, uh, or I'm sorry, people on average said that uh, when asked uh, how much do you value democracy personally, uh, said eight out of 10 was, was the average response we got in, in six countries. Um, what was interesting was the variation, uh, the demographic variation, particularly amongst youth. And this is a, a point that the Sunnylands principles highlights. Uh, in countries like Australia and Japan, there was actually less enthusiasm amongst youth uh, for democracies. And partly, you know, one, one would venture that, that they may be taking it for granted now. Um, but in developing democracies, and in, in, that included India, Indonesia, and South Korea, in fact, the youth were more enthusiastic about democracy uh, than people of an older generation. And even in China, actually, respondents, uh, although uh, you know, we didn't ask what, what, how you define democracy, uh, uh, youth there said that it, it mattered to them. On, uh, sort of, they were asked to rate it an eight out of ten. Uh, generally, on average, uh, said, was, was was the response we got in China for how important democracy was for them. Um, so, so I think the enduring appeal, even though I think we all acknowledge that democracies are not perfect and, and are co constant works in progress, uh, that, that it does remain an enduring, enduringly popular uh, notion to, to organize governments. Uh, the third sort of uh, uh, notion I highlight is the, is the diversity of democracies. And, um, you know, you say, take something like freedom of speech, there isn't necessarily a cookie cutter approach amongst uh, the transatlantic community, amongst the Western world, uh, the, US, the United States and Germany have very different freedom of speech laws, for example. Um, and uh, that's even translating now, as A.B. mentioned, into technology governance, where there are very different attitudes uh, in the United States and Europe to, uh, to emerging technologies. Uh, when, 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 as democracy, democracy spread, particularly in the developing world, it's only natural that that variation should increase. And there have been notable cases just recently in the last year or two uh, involving in the Philippines and in Indonesia and in, Indi in India, where I'm from, um, where, uh, you know, I think we have very different perceptions of, of uh, democracy at work. Um, and, and uh, I, you know, I think that is something to acknowledge uh, going forward. The final point uh, I would make is that, you know, while we tend to think of the support for international democracy around the world as being a, a US-led initiative, um, and, and with good reason, I think, for, for, for uh, traditionally, what we're increasingly seeing is developing countries also taking a, a growing, uh, if, if still nascent role in supporting democracy around the world. Um, and, you know, I would point to cases such as, uh, you know, the Bali Democracy Forum in Indonesia uh, to uh, some of the uh, civil society support that I know countries like Brazil and India do. Um, and um, uh, even if it is also in, sometimes not in the, uh, in the guise of uh, democ uh, democracy support or using the language of democracy support, but uh, you know how these countries are supporting uh, election procedures, um, uh, things like electronic voting, uh, in some cases pioneering uh, developments like that, uh, civil military relations uh, in another area where, where uh, some of these countries are taking a leadership role. And so you know, I think the, the more the United States and US policymakers can also not just uh, acknowledge and, and understand this, but, but harness these uh, efforts uh, in other countries, the more it will actually uh, improve uh, cooperation around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruva, terrific. I'm gonna come back to a couple of those with the panel in a moment, but let's, uh, let's round out the opening set of presentations from Lynn, who will tell us a bit about um, some of the next steps we are planning or might think about planning uh, to develop this project. Okay. Thank you, Mike, and um, CSIS for organizing this event and inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, 
I also want to say that it has been a pleasure working with CSIS and Sunnylands on this very important initiative. Um, our successful partnership has led to some very interesting and stimulating discussion in Sunnylands this January with our esteemed colleagues from the US and Asia to develop Sunnylands principles statement and the framing of possible regional cooperation on maintaining the liberal democratic order. This morning I was asked to outline the next steps of this initiative, but before I do that, I want to briefly introduce NED's Democratic Unity Program and how this um, initiative fits into our program. For NED, um, democratic cooperation building has been one of our institutional priorities and commitments since 1984, when we stipulated in our founding statement of principles and objectives that international cooperation in advancing democracy would be one of the five program areas of our work. So um, over the past three decades, we have supported initiatives that have connected groups across borders and between regions and established democracy hubs in different parts of the world and nurtured um, regional democracy networks. And we've also encouraged other countries to establish their own democracy support institutions, such as the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. Um, with this current democ democracy recession, um, we have prioritized engaging with our partners on building and strengthening cooperation among Democrats in defending democratic norms and freedoms. In particular, we have been supporting efforts to bring established democracies together, largely on a regional basis, in order to safeguard democratic norms and values um, against the liberal or malign influence on new and established democracies. Asia, a Pacific region, which lacks its own regional infrastructure for defining and promoting democratic norms, has been a priority of our democratic unity program. Building on our existing networks in Asia, we've been supporting the development of a community of partners from various sectors, ranging from think tanks in the media to parliamentarians and business and civil society leaders. The goal is to um, encourage a stronger develop, uh, commitment to democracy through diplomacy and development assistance in Asian democracies, such as Japan, India, South Korea, and Indonesia, and to anchor um, regional multilateral mechanisms in shared norms and democratic values. In this context, um, this initiative is an important part of NED's democratic program, and we are excited to work on uh, next steps with um, CSIS, Sunnylands, IRI, NDI, Freedom House, and all the rest of the Asia signatories of this statement. As for what comes next, um, there are a number of ideas in discussion, but I will mention two this morning. Um, first, we're in discussion with a number of signatories about a series of rollout events like the CSIS event this morning, but in Asia to raise awareness of Sunnyland's principal statement, as well as invigorate public debates and discussion on the importance of defending the values and principles highlighted in the statement. Um, and the second, Building on the momentum gained at the Sunnylands meeting, um, we will continue the dialogue among the signatories on best ways to enhance regional democratic partnership. In particular, our signatories from Asia agree that it will be extremely helpful and useful to convene another multi-day dialogue like the Sunnylands retreat, but somewhere in Asia where more Asian leaders and thinkers on democracy could take part in this initiative. So uh, we hope to convene this meeting somewhere in Asia where we will focus on seeking stronger and broader regional endorsement and support, as well as developing concrete plans where our US and Asia partners can demonstrate their commitment to this partnership and defending shared norms and democratic principles. With the pandemic, we have to be creative about how to move forward with these um, two follow on activities, but we're encouraged by the enthusiasm of our Asia signatories who've been in regular communication with us to discuss keeping this initiative alive and relative, relevant while still dealing with the uh, pandemic. This is an important time for our democratic nations and Democrats in, um, in Asia as we all understand what is at stake. And this initiative has laid a solid foundation to strengthen our engage engagement with um, Asian democracies as they consider their partnership as well as a leadership in protecting and upholding democratic governance norms in the region and beyond. And we look forward to working on the next steps with you all. 
I will stop there, Mike. Great, thank you, thank you, Lee. Um, uh, so, uh, Lynn, excuse me. So, um, the uh, the point Juva made earlier is a really fascinating one, that um, younger Americans, younger Brits, um, younger Japanese, um, do have some skepticism about what democracy has, has delivered. And Juva speculated perhaps it's because we take it for granted, which which could be the case. We've also had. Um, some failings uh, in our democratic governance, um, including, I think many people would argue the current response to coronavirus. Um, but it goes beyond youth. In our surveys uh, of thought leaders, we've asked every couple of years in our, in our questions, what, uh, how important are these norms of um, human rights, of free and fair elections, of accountability? And I mentioned that across Asia, in India, in Japan, and the Philippines, they get more uh, support every time and since uh, about a decade ago, what we found is that when you rank sort of the top 10 democracies in Asia, uh, in terms of how important thought leaders think democratic norms are to regional development, to diplomacy, security, the US comes in last, unless you include Singapore, then it's second to last. So as the rest of the world, or at least the rest of Asia, um, with some exceptions among youth, as the rest of Asia, continues to aspirationally at least hold that these are important norms to guide regional development and uh, inclusivity and uh, community building. It's the US and it's the American elites who are saying, nah, we're just, it's just that, you know, what our republic was based on, it's just too flawed. And there are a lot of reasons for that, Iraq and other things, uh, the 2008 financial crisis, we had a lot of blows. So I think one takeaway for Americans in this ought to be there's an awful lot to work with out there. Um, you think about when the NED was founded uh, in the early 1980s, um, uh, Korea wasn't fully democratized, Indonesia wasn't fully democratized, Taiwan wasn't fully democratized, um, Philippines weren't fully democratized. I mean, uh, there has been a wave of democratization since the NED was founded and, and uh, enormous economic development so that there are resources um, as well. And that means, I think this is the underlying point behind the NED's work and our, and our efforts here with Sunnylands and the NED, that um, this is uh, the, the, the shareholders in democracy in Asia, both in terms of the ideas and, 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 and resources has shifted. This is a much more uh, robust and diverse set of shareholders or stakeholders in how we advance democracy. And we need to find a way to tap into it. Um, the uh, uh, Derek Mitchell, who's the head of the National Democratic Institute, uh, emailed a question, and I have to apologize. We had some outstanding panelists on this effort, as you know, but Zoom limits us to how many people we can really put on a public panel. So I have a few comments, uh, and then I'll turn back to our panel on the screen. So Derek from NDI uh, pointed out um, how many efforts are actually underway uh, by countries like India, Indonesia, Korea, Japan, um, and asked that we, uh, we emphasize some of those. Um, uh, the Bali Democracy Forum um, was formed in a much broader, more inclusive way than the community of democracies, which the US started. Uh, Syria was in it at one point. Uh, Iran has been invited. So it's a much more um, open aperture in terms of who gets to engage in discussions of democracies. But that's that's the Indonesian way of advancing this discussion. Um, India for over two decades now, I guess at least, has had the Colombo principles and has, and has, has done, uh, put money behind work on, on these issues in uh, the subcontinent. Um, Korea is very active. COICA, the Korean Development Agency, spends a great deal of uh, money and effort on women's empowerment and other um, elements of this. And um, Japan now is in an interesting debate about changing the way it does um, grants. Um, uh, Ambassador Takasu, who joined us, is in the forefront of this. And the momentum, I think, is building in the diet and the Japanese government to, uh, to do more, um, uh, to continue doing indirect support for accountability and governance uh, through technical training, but to do more direct support for civil society building and, and, uh, and, and what the US would consider more traditional democracy. Uh, building. Um, and these are the kind of things we'll discuss in our follow ons I'd like to throw it back to Druva, though, um, uh, if you could say uh, a little bit more about uh, what you've seen in India, but also in your work at GMF about 
um, some of the different approaches or the different tools that are being used by countries that are not the United States or Australia uh, or Britain. Um, so over to you, Dhruva, if you could. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think um, it, it's still, I think, very nascent. And I think, you know, the, the U.S. has a longer tradition, um, uh, has devoted more resources traditionally, dating back to the Cold War, um, and, and, and has greater expertise in, in, in this uh, area. So I don't think it's fair yet to compare a lot of the other initiatives to, to what the U.S. is capable and, and has been doing. Uh, but that said, you know, I think that there, there has been a, a big push. Um, you know, just to give think of a few examples, in, in, at least in Europe, um, there's, in, in fact, this summer um, uh, in Copenhagen in, in Denmark, there was a new initiative uh, started uh, for, for on, on democracy started by the former NATO Secretary General. Um, so that's, sort of, you know, uh, yet another forum in Europe for and, and very much anchored around the notion of a, a sort of global community of democracies. Um, but, in, but in Asia, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I, right now, it's more, in, as, as you mentioned, like uh, what, what Japan does, so more indirect uh, support in a lot of things. And I, I, I'm most familiar, of course, with the Indian context. Um, a lot of things that, that India does is not necessarily uh, couched in the language of democracy promotion. But there's a long tradition actually dating back to the 1950s even of India providing technical assistance and training uh, to administrators from other developing countries, particularly. This includes election officials. So the Indian uh, election commission has actually has set up an institute which is uh, sort of taking shape right now uh, to um, but but has been doing training for for people in uh, for uh, election officials in Africa and and, and uh, Asia uh, there's one example parliamentary procedures judicial training uh, civil service training um, so there's actually thousands of people from from the developing world who've come to India for for these kinds of initiatives um, although the Indian government actually doesn't we, we found when I was uh, working in India that there isn't even a centralized uh, database of, of how many people uh, India has trained in, in, in this manner. Um, so there's, there's that side. Uh, there's also a growing development assistance. So uh, India has a sort of a, a roughly one and a half billion dollar foreign assistance budget, not a, not a huge amount, but not, neither is it inconsequential. Um, but a small uh, percentage of that is actually going towards uh, female centered uh, and um, initiatives, youth centered initiatives. Um, and so, you know, we, we tabulated, for example, places like, you wouldn't necessarily think of this, Tajikistan, Papua New Guinea, uh, places like that, where India has actually put money behind initiatives to empower women in, in some of these places. Again, often not in an explicitly uh, to support democracy, but to support uh, uh, th their role in, in local governance sometimes. Maybe, maybe the silver lining of the American uh, elites, um, you know, lack of confidence recently in our own democracy. Maybe that, maybe the silver lining is a certain amount of humility and willingness to listen to different approaches. I, I certainly detect in this meeting we had in Sunnylands, um, uh, but, but more broadly, um, that uh, in Delhi, uh, in Tokyo, um, and maybe there are structural reasons for this. Maybe it's because of the, the, the growing authoritarian challenge, uh, maybe because of the, the Chinese challenge. Um, but I do detect um, a much greater willingness in countries like India or Japan that to some extent held up their different approach to democracy as a way to have a bit of autonomy from the United States, a bit of separation. I detect a different mood in capitals like Delhi and Tokyo and, and in Jakarta um, that, you know, it's time to talk to the Americans too. Uh, and the Australians, and, um, uh, and, 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 and get efficiency and get results and not hold this up as a non-aligned movement sort of talking point against the Americans. Is that a fair judgment? What's your sense? You're in these dialogues. I think it's changed a little bit. Uh, again, I wouldn't overstate it. It's a gradual process. It's not like a switch has been flipped. Um, but but I, do, I do think there has been a, gra a gradual shift. I, I meant to uh, mention one other initiative, which is very interesting to observe. Just in the last few weeks, there was an announcement of a new initiative led by France and Canada, uh, which is a global partnership on artificial intelligence, GPAI. And it'll be the 15 founding members, member countries, their secretary will be housed in the OECD in Paris. Uh, but it's interesting to look, all of the, the, the countries are democracies. It's the US, Canada, uh, the European Union, Germany, France, UK, but also Japan, South Korea, India, Singapore, and Australia. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it very much be behind in their founding uh, statement, which is available online, you see a very much um, a focus on democratic principles uh, and how to cooperate in ensuring those democratic principles in artificial in intelligence, which is going to be a, a major uh, for uh, a venue of competition amongst uh, countries in the in the near future. 
Thanks. I, I'm going to turn next to um, Justice Corpio Morales, to Conchita, and to Amy, because we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience um, about the harder problems. So we've talked a lot, and our focus was almost entirely in Sunnylands on how do we advance democratic governance, which is, which is a um, long-term investment across multiple domains, uh, requiring many partners, as, as we pointed out. But there are immediate challenges to human rights and democratic governance that require uh, responses. And uh, so a number of people asked, you know, what about cases where there are just egregious uh, violations of democratic norms? Because in those cases, it's still largely the US uh, that is big enough uh, and has the longest experience speaking out on these issues um, and they can take the blows when a China or another government tries to punish us. Um, and so in those circumstances, democratic unity, so to speak, is a little trickier. Or put a different way, the US really has a unique role, it seems. So Justice um, Corporal Morales, I have lots of emails for you, but they're not questions, they're all praise. Um, you have many fans um, who have pointed out um, that um, uh, one sign of how effective you've been in making the arguments for accountable government and for representation of the people is that you're not allowed to travel to Hong Kong right now. So you've scared somebody in Beijing. But let me turn to you first, particularly since the Philippines is in such a, you know, the Philippines to me is a case where we have a, a, a democratic ally who we need to maintain stability and prosperity and solidarity in Asia. And yet there are enormous uh, democracy challenges and setbacks, as you've pointed out. So uh, maybe help the audience understand what is the role of the US in a case like that, in the case where other countries may not be as able to speak out? Is it important for the US to, to continue playing that role? Well, the US has always been very impartial in trying to assess uh, how democracy works in the Philippines. Albeit, uh, there are some individuals uh, from the US uh, government who are also trying to well, uh, uh, ask the Philippines to be more cautious as far as human rights violations, alleged human rights violations. Let me emphasize the word alleged human rights violations are concerned. Of course, the government uh, uh, insists that, uh, uh, especially with respect to these drug wars, the government uh, insists that these are not uh, human rights violations, but that uh, these are cases of encounters between the victims and the police authorities. Amy, um, you, you're doing a lot of work on Xinjiang on hard problems where there's risk to, uh, some risk to companies, governments that speak out. Marco Rubio and other members of Congress have been quote unquote sanctioned by the Chinese for supporting their um, legislation on Xinjiang. Um, do you, do you, you know, the U.S. is going to keep doing this, I think. Uh, do you think we can get others to join us? Can we get companies? Or is that just not going to ever happen? Your okay. question is, do you, oh, okay, sorry. Well, I'm sorry, for, for, okay. for, for, for Amy, and, and then I'll come back to you, Justice. All right, sorry. <laughs> So it is really challenging, Mike. It's probably one of the more challenging issues of the moment in terms of getting anyone to really say anything. Um, the U.S., at least up to a fairly senior level of leadership, has commented on the situation, has taken steps to more concretely try to address, for example, what's happening in Xinjiang, and we can use that as a proxy for other situations. Um, the EU has done a little bit in the UN Human Rights Council, but we haven't seen really senior level leadership there say very much. Within Asia, also not really much at all. Um, and so I do think it just highlights the challenges right now in this particular environment. We also see just a situation where multilateral institutions, uh, the US role there has weakened. And so a lot of smaller countries don't feel protected um, if they want to say something about a situation like that. And so they're silent or even joining the other side on that one. Uh, so, and in that case, I think there are a bit sides. Um, I think there's just a need for more collective action, right? Both for the US to lead strongly and give cover for others, but also for other countries to learn how to maybe operate a little bit better in coalition on some of these really, um, really 
sensitive issues, but that really demand a response. Uh, Conchita, did you want to add something? So let me. Um, yes, I'm ready has already uh, given a, a comprehensive uh, response to that. Good, thank you. Um, let, let me wrap up um, uh, first by saying what an incredible um, uh, uh, joy it was, what, a, what an incredible experience it was to spend three days in sunny lands, which is an incredible experience under any circumstances, but particularly when we um, were able to take long walks and have deep discussions about issues we all cared about, and to hear the personal experiences of people like uh, Justice Corporal Morales, who, you know, more than the rest of us, really uh, took risks to advance the the principles we cared in cared about. But to hear from Marty Natalegauer from Indonesia, uh, a, a, a very consequential foreign minister and thought leader on these issues in not only Indonesia but Southeast Asia, to hear from Druva about um, the many um, uh, paths, tactical smaller scale money, but important paths India has taken to advance democratic norms. Um, I was struck a public opinion survey in India by a marketing firm advising American companies 10 years ago, asked Indians, young Indians to identify the catchphrase they thought American companies should use to capture the essence of India. And they had Bollywood and Gandhi and all the predictable stuff. And the, the word, the single word that overwhelmingly won for what Indians wanted to be known for was democracy. So um, these are coming from important places of national purpose, um, but in different ways. And it was such an incredible experience to hear um, uh, from Shingaksu in Korea and Takasu Taishi and others about how governments um, are moving gradually to do more in this space because they, they recognize what's at risk. And you can see it in the national security documents and the parliamentary debates in countries like Australia and Japan, um, as countries realize how important and in some ways, how much they took for granted some of these democratic norms. For the United States, I think the lesson is pretty clear. We are not going to create uh, what John Foster Dulles tried to create in 1951, uh, a Pacific Pact. We're not going to create what uh, John McCain, when I worked on this campaign, called for, which is a League of Democracies. Um, the Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific region is eclectic and diverse and multipolar. It is not a US-China bipolar region. There are multiple approaches to security, to prosperity, um, uh, to democracy. Um, the advantage the US has is that overwhelmingly those paths look a lot more like our path than the path China's holding forth. And so the art for us or the lesson for us is we're not gonna have an easy uh, single Zoom call with all the leaders in Asia who are gonna advance democracy with exactly the same plan. This is gonna require a lot of people in NGOs, the Congress, the State Department um, to do a lot of work, a lot of retail work with individual countries in multilateral organizations uh, with multiple nodes. We'll do some things maybe in APEC. We'll do some things trilaterally with Japan and India. We may do some things bilaterally with uh, Korea on women's empowerment. It's gonna be, it's gonna take uh, the kind of um, grassroots, uh, uh, boots on the ground, uh, diplomacy that, um, that we're capable of historically in the United States um, and listening, which we're not always as capable of, but need to get better at. Um, but the, the, it's an exciting topic because the landscape out there is very favorable, uh, even if the setbacks are disheartening sometimes. And so we, this has just been a brief teaser, an introduction to this initiative. And um, we will be doing um, uh, either in person or by Zoom satellite uh, follow-up conferences. Um, uh, we're thinking perhaps in places like uh, Tokyo and uh, Jakarta or Bali, uh, Korea. We'll be doing uh, more of these to continue this discussion um, and, uh, and, and working for a democratic unity that is diverse but effective. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you to my uh, fellow panelists. Thank you, David, for hosting us. Uh, it was fantastic and more to follow. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.